Welcome to Peter Caffrey's Fucked Up Bedtime Stories number five. Legs 11. It's time for the school disco, but Arnold doesn't want to go because he's got no one to go with. Jimmy the Chimp takes him out to try and find a girlfriend, but their search is fruitless. In the end, Arnold does find somebody, Emily, through a school charity event, Sandwiches for Africa. She agrees to go to the dance, and armed with a bottle of mummy's gin, they spend the time smooching and dancing the night away to legendary paedophile Gary Glitter. Do you want to touch? Of course you fucking do. Enjoy your bedtime story. Peter Caffrey's Fucked Up Bedtime Stories, number five, legs 11. What's up with you? Jimmy the Chimp asked. You've had a face like a slapped ass all morning, and if I hear you sigh one more time, I might be tempted to punch your fucking lights out. Nothing's up with me, Arnold muttered, his despondency obvious as he laid on his bed, gazing at the ceiling. Okay, Jimmy said. Let me rephrase the question. Why are you wasting a weekend by acting like a dick? Before you know it, it will be Monday morning and you'll be heading back through those school gates. When you're sitting in class, contemplating a whole week of boredom, won't you regret doing fuck all but moping around? Arnold shrugged. From downstairs, Mummy called out that lunch was ready. Without a word, he got up and walked out of the bedroom. Jimmy sat on the bed, watching him go. You need to have a word with yourself, the chimp shouted. You're being fucking painful. At the best of times, Arnold could be a sulky bastard, but this was different. He wasn't trying to get his own way or manipulate anyone. His sulk didn't seem to serve any purpose, which was at odds with his deep-rooted selfishness. He was depressed, and without any meaningful communication, there was nothing Jimmy could do about it. After lunch, Arnold returned and slumped on the bed with a sigh. Jimmy swallowed back the rage bubbling inside him, trying to remain calm as he issued his ultimatum. I don't want to do this, Arnold, but I don't have any other choice. Unless you tell me what's wrong with you, I'm going to have to fuck you over. And I mean fuck you over in a big way. Arnold didn't react, laying in silence and gazing at the ceiling. I'm warning you, Jimmy said. I'll create so much shit with Daddy, he'll make your life a living hell. Every chance I get, I'll make sure he has a reason to batter you up one more than down the other. That's not fair, Arnold muttered trembled in his voice as he struggled with the turbulent emotions threatening to overwhelm him. Now it's not fair, Jimmy said, but it's all on you. If you won't tell me what's going on, then you're forcing my hand. Arnold sighed as a tear dribbled down his cheek. There's a dance at school, he muttered. Is that all? Jimmy roared, unable to control his disgust. You're acting like a gold-plated cunt because there's a fucking school dance. I don't want to go. Then don't go. Problem solved. But I've never been to a dance, Arnold whined. For fuck's sake, make your mind up, Jimmy sighed. If you want to go, then go. If you don't, then don't. Just make a fucking decision. It's just that, well, I can't go. I might regret this, but why not? Jimmy asked. Arnold's lip trembled as he struggled to hold back his tears. I can't go, he sobbed, because I've got no one to go with. We need to find you a girlfriend, Jimmy declared. And there's no better place to do so than in the town centre. I know all about women, and I can tell you there's nothing they like more than shopping and hanging around fried chicken shops. We'll find you a girl to take to the school dance in a matter of minutes. Arnold shuffled awkwardly, not meeting Jimmy's gaze. Are you sure? I'm fucking certain, Jimmy declared. But first we have to get you dressed up like a cool cat rather than... I don't think people say things like cool cat nowadays, Arnold muttered. Fuck me, listen to Arnold, the font of all knowledge, Jimmy sneered. I didn't just get off the banana boat. I know the difference between trad jazz and bongo fury. Now, unless you think you can pick up a girl on your own, you'd do well to listen to my advice. Okay, Arnold said, allowing Jimmy to set about his styling task. When the chimp had finished, his friend was dressed in a wide range of clashing colours. I look like a right knob. You might think that, and I might think that, but the girls won't, Jimmy explained. You're peacocking. 
You need to stand out from the crowd. Everything about you needs to scream individuality. You're on the edge, a trailblazer, a pioneer of fashion. You march to the beat of your own drum. People are going to think I'm a prick, Arnold complained. You won't be saying that when you're knee-deep in gash, Jimmy sniped. Now, let's get going and find you a date. Jimmy was right. The shopping centre was filled with girls, but Arnold fell into a state of panic. Gathered in groups, gossiping and laughing, the tightly knit gaggles of friends were intimidating. Approaching them would be embarrassing. There was one positive point. While Arnold expected people to point, stare and laugh at how he was dressed, no one took much notice. If anything, their reaction to his gaudy dress sense was underwhelming. Sitting in a burger outlet on the edge of the food court, Arnold sipped a fizzy orange as he watched the girls. What about her? The one in the green top? Jimmy asked. She's a ginger, Arnold whined. Nothing wrong with a ginger sort, Jimmy muttered. Especially if she's ginger colour and cuffs. Anyway, for someone whose last sexual encounter was a... Yeah, was a this number few well, I'm not sure red hair is enough to disqualify a possible candidate. I like her, Arnold said, pointing out a leggy blonde whose sculpted body was wrapped in designer clothes. As a babysitter? Jimmy asked with a sneer. You're not being fair, Arnold said. First you mock me for getting and I'm a wash them out for us, then you tell me this one's too old for me. Arnold, 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 Jimmy said, shaking his head. There's a world of difference between taking a beautiful, sophisticated and somewhat wealthy lady in her mid-twenties to a shitty school disco and now they're acting like being a rich and a fan, but it's not come when you sh- If you can't see that, then even old Ginger Muff is well out of your reach. You're not helping me, Arnold snapped. You ask who I like, and when I point someone out, you just laugh at me. No, you're right. Jimmy's tone was heavy with mock empathy. I'm sorry. I'll tell you what. Go talk to her. You've got as much chance as anyone of pulling up. Go on, use your irrepressible charms to reel her in. What do I say? Jimmy looked quizzically at Arnold. Was he serious? His dumb expression indicated he was. Most women love a bad boy, the chimp replied, struggling to cloak his grin. Be that bad boy. Tell her she's a smoking hot sex bitch and ask if she's ever been... I'm four foot three inches, Arnold said, correcting his friend. You're delivering a punchline, not a fucking CV, Jimmy said with urgency. She only needs the gist, not the full details. She'll be able to see how short you are. Now get going or you'll let her escape. Arnold stood and took a few rapid steps after the woman before stopping and turning back. What's a French tickler? he asked. Don't worry about it, Jimmy hissed. She'll understand. Get going or she'll be picking up her pension by the time we talk to her. Jimmy watched as Arnold chased and stopped the woman. She paused, turning to face him. The silly fucker was only asking her to the school disco. Jimmy wasn't sure whether to laugh or weep at Arnold's utter idiocy. As he walked back to the food court, Arnold was obviously dejected. His face bore a frown tinged with misery and his body was deflated, punctured by the pain of rejection. Jimmy struggled to keep the smirk off his face. What did she say? He asked, feigning excitement. She said she'd love to come with me, but her husband wouldn't allow it, Arnold muttered. Well, I can read lips, Jimmy said with a shrug. I thought she said, fuck off twig dick, or something like that. Arnold's face flushed as embarrassment crawled over his flesh. Did she at least mention your outfit? Jimmy asked, fighting to suppress his laughter. No, Arnold said sulkily. Jimmy knew different. He knew she'd asked if he was a nonce clown's assistant. Sensing Arnold was close to breaking, he opted not to mention how the conversation had ended. The rest of the day was a bust. Arnold sulked and wouldn't talk to any more girls, even refusing to tell Jimmy which ones he liked. As the crowds drifted away and home time approached, Jimmy took control. OK, Arnold, there's one last thing we're going to try. Let's go to the train station. But it's nearly dinner time, Arnold protested. I've had enough and I want to go home. It's just a quick detour and then we'll go. I promise. Arriving at the station, Jimmy guided Arnold away from the main entrance and into a side street. The light was fading and the atmosphere was tense, verging on aggressive. Arnold felt uneasy. I don't like this, he whispered to Jimmy. Relax, Jimmy replied. It's not much further, then you'll see why we're here. As they rounded a bend in the road, a series of bridges under the railway lines came into view. 
In the gloom stood a gaggle of ladies, most wearing short skirts and flimsy tops. Some sported glossy high-heeled shoes in dazzling colours, while others wore fly-length boots. All were adorned with heavy makeup. The women were both alluring and frightening in equal measure. You can pick any of these women to take to the school disco, Jimmy said in a conspiratorial manner. We can use some of our winnings from the dogfighter payer and she'll be your date. I also guarantee you she'll put me either hand of the dance. What do you say? Are they, well, you know, naughty women? Naughty? Do you mean are they prostitutes? Yes, of course they are. The beauty of a whore is she'll pretty much do whatever you want, within reason, if the money's right. So pick one and we'll do a deal. Just decide what type of woman you want. Tall, short, old, youngish, disabled, disfigured. You dream her up and she'll be available. You can even have a pregnant one-eyed dwarf if you fancy that sort of thing. I like her, Arnold said, pointing out a middle-aged whore in a pink latex cat suit. Her hair was bleached blonde and pulled into side bunches. Dressed like a teen girl band member, her face gave away the truth. Dark rings around her eyes, chapped and scabby lips, spotty skin and blackened teeth indicated she'd had a hard life. As Jimmy explained to Arnold how to strike a deal with a hooker, a car pulled up. The cat suit with Paul walked over and leaned in the window. I know that man, Arnold said. Who? Jimmy asked. The one talking to my date. The whore opened the car door and got inside. As the vehicle pulled away, Jimmy shrugged. You missed the boat there, for tonight at least. Unless there's another one you fancy, we'll have to come back another evening. Walking away, Arnold asked, Is Mr. Pedalo fucking my date? Who? Jimmy asked. The blonde girl in the pink cat suit, my date for the school disco. No, Jimmy said with confusion. Who's Mr. Pedalo? He's the man in the car, Arnold replied, talking as if Jimmy was stupid. Yeah, but who is he? Jimmy snapped. He's a teacher at my school. He's the one organising the school disco. Is he indeed? Jimmy said with a wink. Who'd have thought a school teacher would be a pervert? Good news, Arnold said as he walked into the bedroom, a grin plastered across his smug face. Where have you been? Jimmy asked, glancing up from the lingerie section of Mummy's mail order catalogue. You should have been home from school an hour ago. I was doing SFA, Arnold said. Sweet fuck all. No, Jimmy. Sandwiches for Africa. Jimmy threw down the catalogue and rolled his eyes. What the fuck are you talking about? It's a charity thing, Arnold said. We make sandwiches and send them to Africa to feed the starving masses. You're making this shit up, aren't you? Jimmy barked. No, it's real. The bread is donated by local bakeries and supermarkets give us fillings that are close to their sell-by dates. We make the sandwiches and they get delivered to the starving Africans. Jimmy laughed, but his guffaws slowed and faded when Arnold didn't join in. You're fucking serious, aren't you? Arnold nodded. What sort of sandwiches? Today we were making egg and cress. Jimmy whistled, a long, low, mocking sound. Egg and cress sandwiches, with eggs near their sell-by date and leftover bread. By the time those fucking things get to Africa, they'll be stale and mouldy. Not even a starving kid would want them. I reckon you've been conned. Those sandwiches will end up in some petrol station a few miles away. Arnold crossed his arms and adopted a defensive stance. They are sent to Africa, he said with defiance. The sandwiches are frozen and the Air Force fly over rural villages and drop them to the peasants. Jimmy laughed and then held up his paw to calm Arnold. Sorry mate, but someone's taking the piss out of you. What do you think will happen if anyone gets hit by a frozen egg sandwich dropped from a fucking plane? It'll cave their skull right in. The ones that don't kill people will defrost in the fierce noonday sun and turn rancid in minutes. If a malnourished child eats it, he'll shit out his own intestines on the spot. Why the fuck are you wasting your time on this? Arnold blushed. Emily asked me to. Emily? Jimmy asked, lascivious grin spreading across his face. Is she a hottie? Yes, Arnold said with excitement. That's my good news. I'm taking Emily to the dance. Jimmy's eyes narrowed. It's all well and good to a fan of girlfriend, but we'll sh- I don't care, Arnold said with a broad smile. All I know is that Emily's special, and that's enough for me. Fair enough. I'm pleased for you, Arnold. I really am. But take one bit of advice on board. Girls can leave boys on, and things might happen. So make sure you're ready. Make certain you use... Just from all
Mummy's eyes were glazed as she hummed and nodded her head in time with a crackle oozing from the poorly tuned car stereo. As the mundane music beat out a half-hearted rhythm, she steered the car through the late afternoon traffic towards the school. Are you sure she's okay to drive? Jimmy asked. I know it's the middle of the day, but I'd swear she's pissed off her fucking face. That gin bottle has taken a right old hammer in this morning. Maybe we should get her to pull in and see if she's up for a bit of a fondle. Arnold shrugged. He didn't care what state mummy was in. He had bigger fish to fry. The excitement of taking Emily to the school disco was overwhelming. He was going on a real date with a real girl. It was something he'd only ever dreamed about, usually at night under the covers, but now it was happening. The year six pupils were allowed home at lunchtime to get ready for the dance, and dressed in his multicoloured finery, he was on his way to collect Emily. It didn't matter that the disco was at school, or that he was being held in the cafeteria during the afternoon. Nothing mattered. He was going on a date with a girl. Everything was perfect. What could go wrong? He looked sharp in his lime green, orange and blue striped tracksuit. Daddy laughed when he saw it, saying Arnold looked like an imbecilic wannabe clown, but Jimmy assured him it was bang on trend and Jimmy was never wrong. Now all he needed was the girl on his arm and life would be complete. Mummy parked the car at a crooked angle and beat the hall. The door to a nearby house opened and Emily emerged. Fuck it out! Jimmy screamed, his mockery obvious as the girl approached. How did you forget to mention that? What? he asked, momentarily unnerved by Jimmy's reaction. What? Jimmy howled with derision. Look at her fucking legs. She's got weak knees, Arnold replied. Jesus, Arnold. Last time I saw legs like that, there was a fucking slot in the girl's head. Leg calipers are so 1970s. Only you could end up dating a retro raspberry. I love her, Arnold stuttered, a feeling of shame creeping through him as he watched his new girlfriend stagger towards the car. You don't know what love is, Jimmy spat. Still, the worst case scenario for you won't be a broken heart. It'll be rust on your helmet. As Jimmy laughed, Emily struggled into the car. Arnold smiled at her but didn't offer any assistance. Hello, Arnie, she whispered. Are you ready for the disco? Jimmy laughed louder. That cunt's got a lisp. If she's epileptic too, you've hit the jackpot. Mummy set off, the car veering erratically back into the traffic as a cacophony of horns sounded. Emily sat, eyes locked on Arnold, a simpering grin on her face. Approaching the school, Jimmy whispered to Arnold. Don't be obvious, but look in the bag on the floor at the back of the driver's seat. Arnold did as instructed. The bag contained a bottle of clear liquid. That's one of Mummy's emergency bottles, Jimmy said. Take it with you, and if Emily gets bored or needs a bit of revving up, stick a glove or two in her cola. Trust me, she'll be for as you should out. The car lurched as Mummy steered into the car park, narrowly avoiding hitting several small children. Emily opened the door and clambered out, followed by Arnold, who grabbed the bottle and Jimmy as he followed. Leave me here! Jimmy snapped. I'll stay with Mummy. Arnold shook his head. His anxiety was spiking, and if the date went wrong, he'd need his friend's wisdom. Let's boogie, Arnold said to Emily. Can't! Snapped Jimmy. Okay, boys and girls, get ready for a very special song. You can dance with your feet, but you can use your fingers too, Mr. Pedalo announced from his DJ desk. Next up is the legendary Do You Wanna Touch Me by Gary Glitter. As the paedophile pop star whined about touching somebody, Arnold stood awkwardly, hands thrust into his pockets, while Emily nodded her head in time with the music and sipped her cola. From inside Arnold's tracksuit top, Jimmy muttered, Either do what the song's telling you to do and touch her, or top have a drink. If you carry on acting like a year retired, you'll get nowhere. I've done it once already, Arnold whispered. What? Touched her or touched up her drink? Her drink. Well, do it again. Faint heart never won fair maiden. Arnold leaned across and poured four inches of gin on top of the dribble of a remaining pot. Emily raised the glass, smiled and downed its contents. Pour her another, Jimmy instructed, and then get yourself ready. As soon as there's a slow song, go in for the smooch. Pull her close. You'll have those new eyes. If it's safe, it's narrowing this up. Girls love that move. Nothing turns them on like a... Arnold nodded, willing Mr. Petalo to play something which brought the tempo down. Just the thought of touching Emily's... Caused a stirring in his trousers. 
And now, one for the lovers out there, Mr. Pedalo announced with a leer. It's the all-time classic, Jetain, from Serge Gainsborough and Jane Birkin. As the music swelled and built, Arnold led Emily onto the dance floor. Many of the other children, still standing with their backs to the wall, sniggered and pointed as he pulled her close and Emily stumbled and Arnold held her tighter to stop her falling. I feel funny, she muttered. Reassured she'd gained her balance, Arnold let his hands creep. Sara was soft and flabby. It was like holding two chunks of ox liver. While fondling Emily's posterior wasn't as arousing as he'd hoped, the overall level of excitement ensured his mindful of Jimmy's advice, he clinched Emily tighter. I feel dizzy, Emily slurred. Arnold responded by As Serge muttered the language of love, Emily staggered again before belching, her breath sour and acidic. Eyes rolling, she slumped in Arnold's embrace. Mistaking her condition for arousal, Arnold moved in for a kiss. As he opened his mouth, the squirt of her curdled puke sprayed over his face, a spurt of bile landing in his mouth. Arnold jumped back, letting Emily fall to the floor. Twitching and spasming, she slipped into a grand mal seizure. Bingo! Jimmy shouted. That's the fucking trifecta! Emily writhed on the ground, the froth from her mouth mingling with puke and drool as she breathed erratically. Her shuddering arms and legs thrashed inside her flimsy party clothing, and as her legs kicked, her scope rode up around the waist. No knickers! Jimmy howled. Your bird really is the gift that keeps on giving. Arnold looked down. Emily's lack of underwear was embarrassing enough, but to make things worse, a trail of liquid shit was oozing from her anus, forming what looked like a question mark of diarrhoea on the floor. Unsure whether to abandon his date and run for the exit, or attempt to hide her shame by smearing the shit across the ground with his shoe, Arnold felt Emily's allure fading. Whatever he did, whichever course of action he followed, there could be no good outcome. He was, as Jimmy would no doubt put it, fucked. Before he could decide on an appropriate course of action, Mr. Pedlow appeared by his side. Help me get her outside, Arnold, the teacher said. I think she needs some fresh air. Arnold took off his jacket and dropped it onto the chair, placing Jimmy the chimp on top. Don't leave me here, Jimmy shouted. I want to see how this cluster fuck ends. Led by Mr. Pedlow, Arnold manoeuvred his girlfriend out of the fire door and into the afternoon air. Take care of her. I'll be back in a bit, Pedalo said to Arnold, before dashing back to his DJ position. Emily's eyes watered, a sliver of drool hanging from her pale lips as she struggled to regain her composure. What have you done to me, Arnold? she asked with uncertainty. I didn't do anything, Arnold replied, shocked at the accusation. You did, she spat. What did you put in my dwink? Why was Emily turning on him? He hadn't done anything wrong. He'd been kind enough to ask her to the dance. He'd given her some of Mummy's special drink. What more could he do? My mother was white, Emily gasped, pushing Arnold away. All boys are the same. You're trying to take advantage of me. All boys are rapists. A tremor jolted through Arnold's body. Why was she calling him a rapist? He wasn't sure what a rapist was, but he knew it was bad. It had something to do with sex, but he hadn't done sex with her. Rapists went to prison, where they were tortured and stabbed by other prisoners. He'd seen it in films, so it had to be true. He couldn't be a rapist. Leave me alone, Emily screamed, whirling her arms as if being attacked. Someone help me! Arnold's a bad boy! Putting his hand over her mouth, Arnold tried to stop Emily from shouting, but she wouldn't be quiet. She kept on yelling and screaming, lashing out, hitting his face, howling how he was a bad boy. So he reached into his tracksuit pocket and pulled out his penknife. Arnold stabbed Emily in the throat. He plunged the blade in again and again. He kept on stabbing until she fell silent and lay still, unmoving, at his feet. Why the fuck did you bring a knife to the school dance? Jimmy asked. You told me I'd need protection, Arnold muttered, shifting awkwardly as his friend glared at him with disgust. I meant you needed a rubber d- Okay, look, it's a, you know, it's not that you should reenact the story of Sid and Nancy for fuck's sake. Arnold, they'll put you in a special place for nonce kids and you won't get out till you've been castrated and given a new identity as a Paraguayan rent boy. You're so screwed it's not even funny. Arnold's face contorted as his bottom lip trembled. Jimmy, can't you? Fuck no, Jimmy snapped. 
I'm not reanimating a dead kid you've had to kingdom come. There are certain things I don't get involved with, and dead crippled children is one of them. I need time to think of a way out of this, and until I do, the best thing is to hide the body. But if you... One more word from you, Arnold, and I swear I'll see to it, you fucking hang. Now put the body in one of the dustbins, and hopefully I can figure out a way to get you out of the shit. Arnold struggled to lift Emily. It wasn't that she was heavy, but he was weak. Jimmy tutted with contempt as he watched the debacle. Arnold, you need to work on your core strength. Just get the body in the bin, and then shut the fuck up, because I think I've got an idea. Jimmy and Arnold crouched behind a parked van, watching the prostitutes loitering under the railway arches. It was still early evening, and there weren't many Johns around. What makes you think he'll come? Arnold asked. Trust me, he'll be here, Jimmy said, his confidence inspiring. If there's one thing I know, it's how nonces act. I watched him closely when he was in his DJ persona. The silly fucker is so pretentious, he genuinely thinks he's something special. He'll be pumped up and ready to fuck, and the only place he's going to get any action at this time of day is with these ladies. Arnold nodded, a trickle of comfort creeping into his doubt-laden mind. So what's the plan? Jimmy grinned but didn't speak. Come on, tell me, Arnold cajoled. I promise I won't mess it up. It's a bit of a master plan if I say so myself. Jimmy's eyes sparkled with pride as he spoke. If my assessment is correct, our Mr. Petalo is something of a fantasist, and the fuel for his desires is good old-fashioned pornography. He's from an age that was defined by cum shots, and as a result he loves shooting his spunk into people, on the people, all over the place. He likes to see it dripping out of their claws, and a snake spattered across their bellies, dripping off their noses. However, I reckon he freaks out if he gets even a tiny drop of his own jizz on himself. He won't be able to stand up in a rubber filled with his own spunk in his car. I don't understand, Arnold muttered, struggling to see the point Jimmy was making. Leave the thinking to me, cuntooks. The pair spent some time discussing the physical attributes of the local streetwalkers, with Jimmy educating Arnold on how to identify those who'd be willing to offer bareback services for an extra few quid. An occasional car pulled up and drove away with a girl on board, but there was no sign of their target. Arnold sighed every time it was another driver. Calm down, Jimmy said, his exasperation growing with every outburst. He'll have to pack away his DJ shit, tidy the cafeteria and lock up before he comes down here. Have some faith. Arnold breathed deeply and tried to have some faith. It didn't work, but as his desperation bubbled up again, another car slowly crawled into view. It's him, Arnold hissed. Jimmy nodded sagely. You watch, Jim said. I bet he goes for the pink cat suit again. He's a man of habit. The car pulled up next to the middle-aged cat-suited whore, and without any negotiation, she got in. As it pulled away, Arnold asked, What do we do now? Give him five minutes. That's all it'll take. Almost to the prescribed second, Arnold watched Mr. Pedalo's car reappear. Stopping short of the arch under which the horse gathered, the passenger door opened and the hooker got out. As she walked back towards the others, Jimmy nudged Arnold and pointed as the driver's door opened for a few seconds before closing again. He's dumped it, Jimmy hissed. Dumped what? His rubber Johnny. It'll be on the road filled with his spunk. Go get it. What? Arnold asked with disgust. Go and get it now, Jimmy ordered. I'm not touching it. Yes, uh, I'm any I'm not asking you to gargle with a fucking contents, Jimmy snapped. We need it to get you off the hook. Either you fetch that condom, or your arsehole will be raped to bits in the prison showers. It's your choice. In the dark, Arnold crept along the curb, searching the tarmac until he found the Johnny bag filled with Mr. Pedalo's sex mug. Dump it on and work it in, Jimmy instructed. I don't know what you mean, Arnold muttered, a note of self-pity in his voice. Arnold carefully unknotted the condom and turning it upside down, fighting the urge to be sick, he reached out a trembling finger and tried to shag her down the muscle. Jesus Christ, Jimmy sniggered. With a technique like that, I'm amazed the girls aren't forming a cue to experience your magic touch. Arnold blushed, embarrassed by the criticism. Does it matter? he asked. She can't feel anything. It's for the best she's no longer with us, Jimmy mocked. If she could feel your clumsy attempts at massage, she'd be off, dead or not. Be a bit more delicate. 
Arnold pulled away. Do I have to mess around with his jizz? Can't we just leave the condom by her body? Do what you want, Jimmy snapped. Why should I care? It isn't me who'll spend the next few decades in a nonce hospital. Leave the condom there and let's go home. Of course, if you don't want your anus to permanently resemble a raspberry cupcake which has been smashed to bits by Big Ben Bob at the prison tea party, you could do what I tell you. Arnold shrugged, his bottom lip trembling as the tears welled up in his eyes and tumbled down his cheeks. He continued to work Mr. Jimmy told him to stop. Right, that'll do the trick. Now we need to clean up your knife and hide it in Pedro's car. Once we've done that, we can get off home and raise the alarm. Arnold looked surprised. We're going to tell the police where to find Emily's body. Are oh, we fuck? Jimmy snapped. We're going to tell the police about Mr. Pedro and his predilections. We're going to point a finger and let the police find the body. We're going to bait the trap. Well, when I say we, I mean you. Me? Arnold asked, a tremor in his voice. You, Jimmy said, nodding. The room wasn't anything like Arnold expected. He'd seen police dramas on the telly, and the interview rooms were bare and stark, white walls and the sort of chairs you usually found in doctors' waiting rooms. This was different. There were two large sofas with deep, sumptuous cushions, brightly coloured rugs and a beanbag which looked like an oversized ladybird. Toys were scattered around, and on the table were bowls of jelly beans and licorice all sorts, a jar of chocolate biscuits and a plate of jam donuts. Arnold sat on one of the sofas, cuddling Jimmy the Chimp. When he asked if he could bring Jimmy, they'd happily agreed. The fat policewoman sat next to him. She kept smiling and ruffling his hair, telling him he was brave and it wasn't his fault. Mummy sat on the other settee, next to a woman who constantly made notes in a big black book. Can I have another donut? Arnold asked. The policewoman nodded, and as he stuffed the sugary treat into his mouth, she leaned forward. Arnold, can you tell me what happened when Mr. Pedlow asked you to stay after class? Which time? Arnold asked, his mouth half full. Any time. What usually happened? He'd wait until the other children left, and then he'd close the door and tell me to sit on his knee. When I did, he'd say I was a good boy and that we were special friends. The policewoman picked up a teddy bear and held it out. Can you show me, on Teddy, where Mr. Pedalo would touch you? Arnold reached out his hand and tapped the bear on the behind. He'd touch your buttocks, she asked, clarifying his action. Sort of, Arnold muttered. He touched my... The policewoman looked surprised. Even through your trousers? Arnold looked at Jimmy, seeking reassurance. Jimmy nodded. He had after taking another bite of the donut, Arnold screwed up his face in a fake sob. It hurt my bum bum, he howled. The policewoman touched his hand reassuringly and told him he was a brave boy. Can you tell me what happened at the school dance, Arnold? Swallowing down the last bit of donut, Arnold took a handful of jelly beans. Mr. Pedalo told Emily and me he wanted to have a private party. He said he had a special drink for us and that we should go outside with him. I didn't want to and said no, but he told Emily he wanted to show her his... The policewoman shifted, leaning forwards, eager to hear Arnold's story. What happened when they came back? she asked. They didn't come back, Arnold said, sticking more jelly beans in his mouth. Well, Mr. Pedalo did, but Emily didn't. Mr. Pedalo told me if I said anything about him and Emily, he'd hurt my mummy, and he said... Arnold shuddered, lapsing into silence. What did he say? Looking at the floor, feigning awkwardness as Jimmy instructed, Arnold shrugged. I don't know. I don't understand. What did he say? Arnold looked at the policewoman, his eyes brimming with tears. It's rude. Please, Arnold, you won't get into trouble. You've done nothing wrong. Just tell me what Mr. Pedalo said. Arnold put the last few jelly beans into his mouth and chewed, savouring their sweet and sour taste. He said if I told anyone what he'd done, Arnold sat in bed with Jimmy the Chimp. Along with his glass of milk, he had a big slice of chocolate cake. Mummy bought it for him on the way home from the police station, along with several comics and bags of sweets. 
Even Daddy was kind when they got back, making drinks and asking if he wanted anything. Being a victim was something he'd have to try more often. On the television, the news showed the scenes outside the local police station. An angry mob was gathering, demanding severe punishment for the teacher being held. They screamed abuse and chanted slogans such as Hang the Nomps and No Mercy for Pedalo. The TV presenter stated Mr Pedalo had been charged with rape and murder, as well as several counts of indecency with a minor. He was protesting his innocence despite overwhelming forensic evidence of his involvement in the crime. The arrest happened swiftly after an unnamed victim managed to escape and alert the police. That's me, Arnold said, every time the news anchor mentioned Child A. You've learned a valuable lesson, Jimmy said as the programme moved on to financial news. If you're having relations with a girl, you need protection. But that doesn't only mean carrying a weapon. It could be something simple. Hit the name or a rickets, telling her your name's Terry, or even tying your feet to a large piece of furniture before... In this case, I'll admit I got it wrong, Arnold said. You were right. No good will ever come from dating. Too right, Jimmy said with a laugh. Arnold smiled, nodded his agreement, and turning over, drifted off to sleep. That's your bedtime story. Good night. Sleep tight. Legs 11 was written by Peter Caffrey, narrated by Peter Caffrey, and engineered by Peter Caffrey. So if it was shit, there's only one man to blame. Fucked Up Bedtime Stories are released exclusively via the Godless platform on the 19th of every month and comprise an ebook and audio file for a mere 50 cents. That's right, 50 cents. What the fuck are you going to get for 50 cents? Even a prostitute wouldn't look at your cunt for that much. It's a fucking bargain. That's what it is, a bargain. Now go and do something productive with your time.